Tonight we're here hoping to observe the tra transit of an exoplanet. I know it should be happening tonight in a, in a couple of hours. There's a, a star called WASP-33, hundreds of light years away. It's, it's a long way away. Tonight, one of its planets, which we, we already know some information about, is, is going to be passing in between us and the star itself. Let's imagine that our sun here is, is the star that we're observing. Obviously, it would be much smaller and much fainter. But then imagine that in front of this star passes a planet, perhaps a rocky planet, we're not sure. Um, just as it passes in front of the star, the light dips and then it passes off again, then the light increases. It's not quite like that, unfortunately. The, the, the dip in light is only a, a few percent, if anything. So um, when we're actually seeing the star, we don't see any difference. It looks just as bright as it did before the transit, in the middle of the transit and at the end. It's afterwards when we start to look at the data, then we start to see this dip. Is that what you're using? <laughs> Sadly, no, this is, this, is, uh, this is not my telescope for tonight. This is for using something, uh, observing something a little bit more important. But um, just on, on the side of the roof there, you can see a small, uh, a small dome for a half meter telescope. That's what we're using today. Uh, it's called the P25N, 0.5 meter. Um, so it's only half a meter diameter, unlike this uh, 4.2 meter mirror inside the WHD here, but um, it's, it's still perfectly capable of seeing these, these relatively bright stars and also to see these dips as well. It's just, uh, just on the roof of the same building uh, and there are some problems associated with this obviously. So, so the telescope itself is, um, is not isolated from the building, which means any vibrations in the building um, cause the telescope itself to vibrate. So one example is if the observers at the WHT uh, want to want to move to a new target and they move their dome around, the, the motors and the, the huge dome that moves around vibrates the entire building and you see it with our, with our small telescope, you see a wobble. Um, so that's, that's un unfortunate, but apart from that it's not too bad at all. It's not looking as bad as it was earlier, to be fair, but we do have some thin, thin clouds up high there. Not completely disastrous for these observations because we're just looking at the brightness um, and we, we measure the brightness relative to other stars, so if a cloud passes over both our target and a comparison star will, will dip and so we can still deal with that. So this is a satellite image of the Canary Islands where we are with La Palma here um, and as you can see we're sat just on the edge of this bank of cloud desperately hoping that the wind will change and push it further south so that we have clear skies which are sat just just out of our reach. We're about to open the dome now um, so it's a bit noisy just to make sure nobody's in the way. One of the problems we have here sometimes is that spiders make their way into the dome and uh, make webs across the, uh, the aperture for the telescope, so we have to come and clear it every now and then. Basically, we have the primary mirror inside here, which is half a meter. It doesn't look like half a meter, but I'm assured, assure you it is. The light beam from any particular object, by the time it reaches us, we're looking at parallel light. We pass directly down, bounce straight off the mirror, come back, hit the secondary mirror up here, bounce it back again, directed down through this tube, through the tube, through the filter, and then straight into the science camera here. <laughs> there we go. But I think now we're going to head downstairs into the control room because it's pretty chilly up here and uh, we've got a little break now between, between now and the transit so we've got time to move around. So this, this is the, the star WASP-33, uh, this is the target and this is a comparison star. It's the nearest bright star that we can use to compare the brightness. It's important to have at least one other star in the field of view that's nearly as bright as your target or brighter preferably. Um, and this is because we're looking at 
the difference in brightness of the target and how that changes. And of course, if a tiny little cloud passes in front of the, the telescope that we can't see on the image, therefore we wouldn't know it was there if we didn't see also a drop in this comparison star. This, this one, I think, is, is roughly 300 light years away, so it's, it's relatively close, actually, um, in the grand scheme of things. It's brighter than our sun, significantly brighter, and the planet that we're looking at, I think, is quite, quite close in. It's one of these things called a hot Jupiter, which is a uh, Jupiter-sized mass or, or, and or radius, um, but much, much closer into the star. And I think this, this is one of the obscure ones, which is actually orbiting the star around the poles of the star. So the star is rotating in one direction, um, but the planet is orbiting 90 degrees to that, which is, is unusual. So it's quarter past seven now, and it should begin at half past eight, so we've got just over an hour. Our target is here. Every 10 seconds or so, we're, we're having a refreshed image. And the, the brightness, as we see it, is going to, is changing from image to image, and that's just to do with atmospheric turbulence. The actual dip in the light curve is, is totally invisible to us, but later on when we reduce the data, we should be able to see it. It's quite hard to kind of comprehend the whole, the fact that this, this is happening and this is what I'm watching, even more so because you can't really see it. But when you do get the data at the end, it, it's very re rewarding being able to see and, and be quite confident that you know what you're seeing. A planet from another solar system passing in front of another star is, is phenomenal, really. But because you never get to see it, do you ever think, is it happening? Have I got it wrong? Is something else making this happen? Or, or, or is that beyond doubt that it's a planet? Well, from time to time, um, you do question yourself. Um, but it's, it's, if it's not a planet, we have no idea what it is. So uh, we've, got to, we've got to go with what we think. So. Well, the, the important thing is that it's much closer to its parent star. So it's actually orbiting the star every 1.2 days or something. Um, which means that twice a week it's visible at night. The rest of the time it's visible during the day, or therefore not visible. Actually, one of the most interesting things to look at at the moment is the fact that the, the host star itself exhibits what we call delta scuti pulsations. So that's uh, the star itself is pulsating and growing brighter and dimmer on a, a sm even smaller scale than the, the transit. But there is these little wobbles um, in the light, light curve. And this is the only star at the moment that we know of that exhibits stellar pulsation as well as hosting a planet. It's just tracking the star at the moment, which means it's just following it as it, as it crosses across the, uh, passes across the sky. And, and the, the CCD is just taking exposures of 10 seconds. It started off with longer exposures earlier because we had a bit more cloud, but the cloud seems to have cleared up a little bit. We've got one of these uh, sky webcams here, um, which shows there's still a few patches, but it's not as, as bad as it was. Theoretically, everything is automated, but the, the tracking system of the, tele of the telescope isn't perfect. And particularly for exoplanets um, and other differential photometry, you need to make sure that your target stays on the very same pixel on the CCD. So it's always good to try and keep the target in exactly the same place. And so I'm having to make slight adjustments to the, the tracking from time to time just to make sure it's not drifting off. I usually occupy my time with doing some of the work or watching a movie or something. So yeah, it can be uh, it can be a little dull, but you've got to keep an eye on it all the time. So you've, got, you've still got to be here. Um, well, we're just getting a bit more cloud coming in, um, as you can see on this sky cam, um, which means the total number of photons that we're reading on the CCD is dropping. Why aren't you wearing shoes? It's uh, quite warm in here, so. My feet were getting hot. <laughs> and I have a weird habit of always taking my shoes off when I'm settled somewhere. So f for the last couple of hours, the, uh, the planet's been in front of the star, passing between us and the star and blocking out a small fraction of the light. Um, and we're just coming up now to the end of the transit. So the planet's about to, to move out of the, of the, the stellar disk here. But again, we won't see it. It's, it's a small, small change in brightness. The star's going to get a little bit brighter, um, but we won't see it on the screen. We'll have to wait till we see the data. We like to um, observe for a little bit longer, just so that we have a little bit more data outside of transit. The graph we're going to get for the, for the, for the dip is going to look something like this. But we want to try and get as much data here and here as possible. The more we can understand 
the rest of the universe, we think the more we can understand the Earth itself and the processes that made the Earth, and it, in, in a sense, the processes that are going to unmake the Earth through, throughout the, the, the rest of, of time, if we know how other stars and planets evolve, we can predict how our star and planet will evolve with more accuracy. And that, that's always something that the human race is going to benefit from, we think. So. The more we observe uh, extrasolar planets, the more we realize that our solar system is, isn't a typical solar system. Um, most solar systems have these huge gaseous hot Jupiters close to the star. And we're still trying to understand exactly why this occurs in most other planetary systems and not here, and whether it will occur here at some point in the future. And obviously, it's unlikely for anything to happen in my lifetime or even in a, in a few generations. But with any luck, we'll still be here in a few thousand years, and the information we gather now might be useful.